Let's face it, the future is electric. And I, for one, am all for it. Electric cars, solar panels on my roof, and giving back to the grid in any way that I can. And I'm sure you're with me too, right? But in order for all of us to be on board with this electric future, we need to talk about energy storage systems. The next generation of energy storage, to be exact. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Increased installations of DC ultra fast chargers, the rise of distributed grid systems, and a wider adoption of residential solar installations are making energy storage systems more important than ever before. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Hunter Freeberg and Prasad Parachuri from OnSemi and I examine the trends in EV chargers, solar, and energy storage systems. The role that battery storage integration plays in energy storage systems and how OnSemi is promoting innovation in the world of energy storage systems. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from OnSemi. Hi, Prasad. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi. And hi, Hunter. Thank you for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so Hunter, we are talking about next generation energy storage systems today. But before we dig into the details, can you give us an upper level view of these kind of systems? Yeah, so the energy storage systems that we're going to focus on today will largely be residential scale systems. But first, just a little bit of background on energy storage systems as a whole. They're segmented in a couple of different ways. One is, again, by power level and also by AC-coupled or DC-coupled systems. Now, those residential systems that we'll focus on today will either be single-phase systems, typically in the range of 4 kilowatt to 7 kilowatt, and then there are also split phase systems, a little bit higher power, usually eight kilowatt up to 15 kilowatt or sort of the building block sizes that you'll see. Then you have commercial and utility scale, larger systems. These are three phase systems on the commercial side, 100 kilowatts up to two megawatts with those block sizes being in the range of 15 kilowatt to 150 kilowatt. And then for utility scale, these are usually five megawatt and above where your block sizes are 150 kilowatt to 300 kilowatt. And the reasons for adopting energy storage systems, either standalone or coupled with many other renewable energy markets, is for load shifting, for backup power, and for peak power support. Okay, so what kind of overall market trends are you seeing when it comes to energy storage systems? So the general market trends, or first I'll say energy storage systems as a whole, are expected to grow substantially in the upcoming years. So at a current 100 gigawatt hours in 2023 of established installations, we're expected to grow to about 258 gigawatt hours in 2026. And that's at a compound annual growth rate of 37%, so huge growth. And this is tied to many different trends in the industry, whether that be with solar, with coupled battery energy storage, like we'll talk about today, whether in standalone uninterruptible power supplies to accompany DC fast chargers and high power megawatt chargers in distributed grid systems, and as well as microgrids, again, at that residential level with solar and combined energy storage systems. So Prasad, what about trends in EV chargers themselves? What are you seeing in this case? Yes, we have two types of EV charging. One is a level two chargers which are normally located at homes in residential locations. They are direct AC chargers mostly, and they are up to 11 kilowatt in general, but it can go up to 19 kilowatt. And the other one is a DC fast chargers. They can directly charge the batteries going from 20 kilowatts to 360 kilowatt type of applications. And these level two chargers are mostly AC connectors with GFCI, circuit breakers type of applications implemented for the safety purposes. And with the new level two chargers nowadays coming is a residential solar based direct DC charging also included into it as part of the storage and the EV charging capability. 
and most of these are discre- uh, they are below 19 kilowatts as we talked about when they operate from line to line ac input that is at 240 volts and low power discrete or modules will be used in these topologies while in case of the dc fast chargers where we have a backup of energy storage with the batteries or maybe a solar energy backup are also the wind energy and the fuel cells also will be added to it to power the peak charging. If you have multiple cars are coming at all the stations and you need to charge these peak power, these alternative energy solutions and the backup energy will be supplied to these cars and that reduce the load conditions of the utility. Okay, so what about trends in the solar and storage arenas? So in the solar and storage, there are, as Hunter mentioned previously, there are residential solar inverters and the commercial solar inverters and the utility scale. As we are focusing on the residential solar inverters here, we have a solar inverters as we're talking about single phase 120 volts applications or line to line 240 volts application. They are from four kilowatt to seven kilowatt and in the line to line 240 volts, it's up to 15 kilowatts applications. These converters have with a battery backup voltage of either 40 vol- 48 volts batteries or 96 volts batteries, and in some cases, going up to 200 volts. And in DC to DC applications, these solar panels are charged these batteries with the maximum power point tracking functionality. And then that voltage is scaled up using a residential solar inverters to power the home or in a bidirectional condition from home to charge the batteries or to the, your EV application. But in case of commercial applications, you have 1100 volts DC bus voltage, and these power range, they are in the power of 100 kilowatts to 150 kilowatts. So the solar panels are boosted to 1100 volts, and then from the 1100 volts, you will have a three-phase 480 volts AC system will be available. Similarly, for utility-scale applications, bus voltage for the panels is 1500 volts, and we have a DC-DC converters again, here to either step down or step up based on the DC bus voltage to 800 volts or 1250 volts or based on the conditions of the battery there. And then you convert that into a three-phase AC systems for 480 volts. In some case of the utility applications, they will be scaled up using a low-frequency transformer up to like a 4.7 kV or a 13.2 kV type of three-phase AC mains. They call as a high-voltage AC utility applications. So can we talk a bit about battery storage integration? What does that look like for OnSemi? So battery storage integration, like we said previously, falls into two different camps, either AC-coupled systems or DC-coupled systems. And each of them have their merits. I'll say older systems are typically DC-coupled, where it's going directly from the solar into the battery pack and then to power your home. But these systems may not be bidirectional. We do have AC coupled and DC coupled systems that are both bidirectional these days. But again, there's a trade off. So, with your AC coupled systems, as you can see in the figures on the left, you have two inverter blocks. You have your inverter block that's inside the hybrid solar inverter, and then to your AC output, and then your secondary bidirectional inverter block that then connects your energy storage system or your battery pack to that same AC mains line. So you have two inverters in this case. Typically, it'll require more conversion steps. However, the nice thing about these is that you can typically add more capacity later on in the system. Now, with DC-coupled systems, you only have that one inverter block, so there's savings in that regard. But these systems typically cost more up front seeing as you have to install basically all of the battery storage capacity that you could install in the system needs to be installed up front since it's not really variable later on. Okay, so Hunter, can you walk me through a typical PV system for a residence? What would that entail? So again, the traditional unidirectional residential photovoltaic systems that I was mentioning previously, you have your solar array, And then you have the output from that solar array, that power that goes to some kind of DC to DC maximum power point tracking charge controller, like Prasad mentioned. The output from that then goes into your battery bank, where you charge your battery bank, and that is then fed into a solar inverter, DC to AC, so that you can run the appliances in your house, which are typically AC powered. And again, that goes out to your AC loads. So in this instance, your battery bank is is essentially locked. You can't increase the capacity later on, And it's not a bi-directional system. 
So in order to have that bidirectionality, you either need a bidirectional DC to AC or DC to DC inverter and converter respectively. And again, you can't add more capacity later on in these old traditional unidirectional style systems. So let's talk about those bidirectional PV systems. How are those different? So these are a bit different. You can see in the diagrams that we have here, they were typically referred to hybrid or all-in-one systems. Some of them are bidirectional, some of them are not. This first diagram that we have shown is a non-bidirectional system, but I'll explain how a bidirectional system would work. So first and foremost, you have, again, that same solar input. Typically, your solar array is going to range from 3 kilowatt to 18 kilowatt. Your photovoltaic input is usually on the order of 500 volts. You may see that vary maybe between 250 to 650 volts. And again, that varies depending on the power level of that hybrid or all-in-one inverter that you have. Then you have your battery bank input. Again, this is variable. It all depends on the end user's usage and what capacity they need to offset their utilization by. That battery bank will typically range from 60 amp hours to 600 amp hours. Again, could be a little less, could be a little bit more, but sort of the starting blocks that you'll see are in the range of 50 to 60 amp hours, and then they will combine those to scale your battery capacity. And usually the voltage for that battery bank is 400 volts, but you will also see some lower voltage systems, 48 volt systems. Then in these all-in-one or hybrid systems that do not have bidirectionality, you have a separate input for battery charging. This is either 120 volt or 240 volt. The higher voltage, the split phase line-to-line -line voltage, this is going to allow you to charge faster and at higher power. And then ultimately you have your output from that system and that goes to your main panel to again run all of the AC loads in your house. And now in bidirectional systems, what we seek to do, you have these two separate lines for your AC input for your battery charging and your AC output to your main panel. What bidirectional systems do is they combine these two things so that again you have fewer conversion blocks and ideally a cheaper, more efficient system. So Prasad, can you give me some details on an inverter for these kind of bi-directional systems? Yes, as we are focusing on residential solar inverter applications, there are three main topologies in the market our customers are using. They are H-bridge topology, and this is a simple design and simple control and a fewer parts, but it have a large inductor, but it is a lower to medium efficiency with decent THD, but not the best while there is another topology which is called Herrick topology. This is a slightly more complex control and it uses more switches and a higher cost, but it uses a smaller inductor and it is a higher efficiency and better THD. Then there is a third topology which is a, they call a H6.5. It uses more switches, but stress level for this each switch is lower, and, but it is a higher cost, but it is a smaller inductor, high efficiency and better THD. All the three topologies are used by many customers, and some other topologies may be proprietary, and there some of the people may have some patents, so we need to watch out for those things. Then also for utility and commercial applications, they are using different topologies, like a multi-level topologies, both A and PC topologies are very popular topology. So what about the converter? What does that look like? Yeah, in converter topologies, also we have a bidirectional topologies here. In a residential solar and storage applications, based on the panel voltage and the battery voltage, we can able to use a synchronous converter topology or the synchronous boost topology. Or if the battery voltage is than and the lower than both panel voltage, then they combine the both synchronous buck and boost to implement, they call a synchronous buck boost topology. And also, if you need any isolation, then customers are using a dual active bridge topology or resonant CLLC topology. And if the bus voltage is around 1100 volts or 1500 volts, which is the case of utility application, they also use a three-level symmetric bug boost topology and that allow you to use lower voltage devices. So I would imagine that these kind of solutions would be a great fit for the industrial landscape. You're exactly right. So there's a number of different devices that are available from OnSemi. Transistors, either in discretes or in the module form. And we have IGBTs as well as silicon carbide devices. IGBTs are going to give you a little bit better cost for performance. 
whereas the silicon carbide devices, these are going to offer the highest performance, maybe cost a little bit more. But essentially, for these energy storage systems, whether it's, again, that standalone ESS to go with your coupled solar, like in a residential situation, or an uninterruptible power supply as a backup to ensure that you don't have any emergency loads go down. Again, you have these different transistor technologies from OnSemi, the IGBTs and the silicon carbide MOSFETs, to fit these applications and build these topologies that Prasad had previously mentioned. Okay, so Prasad, talk to me more about what OnSemi offers in this arena. OnSemi offers both IGBTs and LHC MOSFETs and diodes for these applications. The one of the major advantage of having the LHC MOSFETs compared to the IGBTs are they can operate at high operating frequencies and also have lower energy losses. That means the turnoff losses are significantly lower with the LHC MOSFETs. And OnSemi have first generation M1 technology and M2 technologies, which is the second generation. And the first generation is come with the 1200 volts and 1700 volts product line, while uh, M2 technology is focused on 650 volts and 900 volts. And in 2022, OnSemi released 1200 volts third generation products, which had highest switching efficiency and best performance in the market. And OnSemi working on third generation 650 volts MOSFETs as we speak, we have started sampling. And those products are, will be released in the Q3 next year. Then we also have a dedicated product line developed for attraction inverters, which are mainly the EV applications, not related to the storage. So as a combination of new M3S 650 volts and 1200 volts families will provide both residential storage applications and the solar inverters. And similarly, the 1200 volts product line target the commercial and utility applications. And we do have both discrete and module applications. So when coming to the more details on the what OnSemi offer is both the discrete product lines and the module product lines. And where, if you look into here, for the 1100 volts and the 1500 volts DC bus solar panel applications, mainly focused on commercial and uh, utility applications, we have multiple topologies are available, like a TNPC, ANPC, and ANPC. These are mostly of these modules are IGBT based because they are high power level like a 150 kilowatt to 350 kilowatt type of applications and scaled up to maybe a one megawatt utility application. Then similarly for the boost stage, like a solar panel voltage to boost with MPPT function, there are two channel and three channel boost topologies are available. These are all modules for high power applications. Then coming to energy storage for residential applications, we have F1 and F2 modules. Like as we mentioned about the solar inverters, there is a hub bridge and H6.5 and various topologies. We have a modules available both on F1, F2 and QG, q one modules. Then similarly, we do have a higher power modules, mainly targeting silicon carbide modules, targeting for UPS, EV charging, and ESS. So these ESS and uh, UPS applications, we target the high power modules while in residential inverter, mainly the F1 and F2 modules are uh, very predominant. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Hunter. Thank you. And thank you for joining me, Prasad. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from OnSemi. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section at EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash